This is Matt show with Intro Stats. Uh, today we're looking at the goodness of fit hypothesis test. So we're going to introduce the goodness of fit hypothesis test today. So as we've been going through these uh, sort of more advanced tests, uh, the four things we've been kind of focusing on when we introduce them, what's the known alternative hypothesis, what type of data do we need to do this test, uh, what are the assumptions, and what's the test statistic look like. So, uh, the goodness of fit test, very famous, very famous. Uh, it's sort of like the multiple proportion test. So we're kind of like dealing with um, the situation where you have multiple um, groups and you're trying to figure out a percentage or compare a percentage from multiple groups. So usually the type of, um, so let's start with the Nolan alternative hypothesis. Um, so usually what you're dealing with is comparing a percentage in uh, multiple groups, almost like the two population proportion test that we went over, but now it's adapted to three or more groups. So you could do this with 20 groups if you want. Um, so the goodness of fit test is kind of like comparing a specific categorical variable in three or more groups is you, the, kind of the usual um, one. So there's sort of two types though of goodness of fit test, and this is what makes it a little bit complex. So sometimes we just want to check if the percentage is the same in different groups, right? So is the percentage of people that have a certain sickness the same in three different cities? Um, and uh, so usually the null hypothesis would be pi 1 equals pi 2 equals pi 3. You could also, by the way, write p1 equals p2 equals p3, uh, depending on what your, or p equals p4, or whatever your stat teacher happens to be using, if your stat teacher is using p or pi. Uh, I tend to use pi a lot. Um, okay, so let's suppose, now the alternative hypothesis, much like we saw, this kind of almost looks like the null and alternative hypothesis for ANOVA, huh? Uh, except it's pi instead of mu. But at least one is not equal. Notice that it does not require all three of the population proportions to be not equal. If it, even one of them is not equal, then we can reject the null hypothesis. So this is sort of the classic, sort of what we call type one. Um, and this is also has some relationship implications. So if you remember when we were talking about ANOVA, we were talking about how when things are equal, it sort of doesn't matter what group you're in. You have sort of the same... Um, the same characteristic, and that would mean that the group doesn't matter. What group you're in doesn't really matter in terms of this characteristic. And this is kind of the idea here. We're comparing a percentage for three groups. Well, if those were equal, then it doesn't really matter what group I'm in or what city I'm from. I have about the same chance of getting the sickness, right? So um, usually if they're equal, again, goes with percentage is not related to whatever the categorical variable is deciding the groups. If uh, at least one is not equal, then maybe it does matter what city I'm in that, uh, in terms of getting sick. So that would mean the percentage is related to whatever the categorical variable is that's deciding the groups. So that's kind of the classic, almost like relationship side of the goodness of fit test. But actually, a lot of times, um, goodness of fit gets its name from this idea of seeing how well it fits with a certain specific percentages. So you're not necessarily trying to show that the percentages are equal. Maybe we know already that the percentages are not equal. Maybe we have a pretty good idea what we think the percentages are. Um, so you could have the second type of goodness of fit. So if you look here, pi 1 equals 0.3. Pi 2 equals 0.5, pi 2 equals 0.2. Notice they're different, right? I, I, don't, I don't think um, that the pi, the percentages are equal. I think the, the first group has about a 30%, uh, the second group has about a 50%, and the third group has about 20%. So um, this is sort of that idea of does it match this? Does it fit this, right? And again, we get that name, goodness of fit. Does our, how, does it, how does our sample data fit with this? Again, at least one is not equal is our alternative hypothesis. Okay? So depending on what you're dealing with, you might have the case where all the, all the p's are equal to each other, or, uh, or pi's, and, or you might have the case where each p or each pi is equal to a specific number that was given to you in the problem that you're trying to, try to see if that, if that's, if that works or not. 
All right, so that's sort of what the null and alternative hypothesis look like. Let's get um, let's get into what well, we're going to go. We'll do assumptions at the end. Let's get into the test statistic a little bit. So the the test statistic uh, again, we can in the two population proportion test we could use a z score, right? We could use the z score test statistic. So, um, but again, that just compares. You know, the, how many standard errors this, this sample proportion is from this sample proportion. Well, if we got, you know, 10 different sample proportions, that z-score is not going to work, right? We're not going to be able to compare the number of standard errors between the sample proportions with a z-score if you got 10 groups. So we have to get a bigger test statistic now. We're going to move into a new test statistic. Just like with ANOVA, we had to move into the F test statistic. We couldn't use T. Now we're moving into a new test statistic, and the test statistic we're going to be using for the goodness of fit is very famous also. It's called the chi-square test statistic. The Greek letter chi look, kind of looks like a squiggly x, so if you see squiggly x squared on a computer program, it's talking about this test statistic and this distribution. If you remember when we covered critical values, how to calculate critical values, um, the, one of the ones I showed you how to calculate critical values for was chi-square. So it's the same one, though the degrees of freedom will be a little bit different this time. Uh, when we're looking up the chi-square critical values, we're going to want to use uh, the degrees of freedom as k minus 1, where k is the number of groups. So it's not the number of people minus 1, it's the number of groups minus 1. Okay? So, and this is the formula for it. Um, it's kind of looks, so it looks very daunting. Uh, this means sum. Now in, in chi-square, it's all about two things. It's all about observed versus expected, right? The, the whole idea of a goodness of fit test really is observed versus expected. And this, is a, this really is brilliant because it allows us to adapt to, you know, as many groups as we want. We could do this for 25 groups if I, if I wanted. So think about it this way, the observed sample counts, or the observed frequencies, observed sample counts is what really happened. What, how many people have this characteristic, okay? And then what you're going to do now is you're going to compare them to what we expect to happen if the null hypothesis was true. Remember, a good test statistic is supposed to judge how far is my sample data, how, how far off is my sample data from the null hypothesis. Well, how do I do that? The way they do that is they look at the observed counts, that's the sample data, versus what they expect to happen if the null is true. We, we call that the expected counts or the expected frequencies. So I want you to get in your head, when you hear the word observed, think, oh, sample data. When you hear the word expected, think in your head, oh, okay, null hypothesis, right? This is a way of representing the null hypothesis. Okay. So let's see if we can kind of look at an example here. So, and the, we're going to go with both types. So I'm going to do both types. So let's suppose that we have some people, um, and we're trying to figure out if this, uh, so these people have a characteristic, if the, um, and we think that the percentage of uh, people that have this characteristic is the same for three different, three different cities. So we're, we're looking at equal, right? So here's our, here's our sample data. Now we're hoping it's random sample data, right? Um, the, so we had a total of 50 people in our sample. Um, the observed count for, popul for group 1 was 24. Observed count for group 2 was 9. And observed count for group 3 was 17. Okay, so these are our three observed counts. And, uh, and now we're trying to figure out, uh, again, how does that match up with the null hypothesis, right? How does it significantly disagree with the null hypothesis? Very difficult just looking at it, like, right? The key is the expected counts, right? I want to compare, these are how many people in each of the groups have this characteristic. So the question is, okay, well then, how does that match up with the null hypothesis? Well, I need to figure out what we expect to happen if the null hypothesis was true. So think about it this way. I have 50 people, and it's the three groups are supposed to be equal in the null hypothesis. So, 
All right, well, if I have 50 and it's supposed to be broken up into three equal groups, what do I expect? Well, 50 divided by 3, right? 50 divided by 3. Sometimes you'll see this formula with the equal to case. Uh, in, in stat books, they'll say E equals N divided by K. N is how many people are in your data set total versus K is the number of groups that are supposed to be equal. So if you do 50 divided by 3, in fact, I'll even write that there, 50 divided by 3, looks like we get about 16.7 or somewhere in there. So this would be about 16. It depends on how much you want to round to it. The more decimal places you keep, the more accurate your, your test statistic gets. So let's suppose this is about 16.67 uh, and 16.67 and 16.67. Notice when I'm assuming that the, the percentages are equal for my three groups, also my expected values come out equal. They're all the same. So I expect all the groups to have about 16.67. Okay? So now what about what would be the expected counts if we had the other one? This this null and alternative odds, where the population one, it, we know they're not equal. We know we think population one is 30%, population two is 50%, and population three is 20%. Well now what do we expect to happen? Well, you know, again, it's what do you expect if the null is true? So if this null was true, what would we expect? A lot of people rely a lot on formulas. You know, the, what's the formula for it? i got to remember the formula. But just think in your head, you might be able to come up with what would you expect to happen. Right? If the null is true, don't I expect about 30% to come from group 1? Because that's what the null hypothesis says. So these 50 people, I would expect 30% of those 50 people or 0.3 of those 50 people to be in group, come from group 1 if the null was true. Does that make sense? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply. Okay, so I'm going to multiply. So uh, 0 0.3 times 50 is going to give us 15. Again, what about group 2? Well, I expect the population percentage is supposed to be 50% in the null hypothesis, so I expect 50% of my group